Inspired by the life of the savvy and ambitious Colombian businesswoman Griselda Blanco comes a new Netflix original limited series. Griselda tells the story of a devoted mother who, with her lethal blend of charm and relentless savagery, creates one of the most powerful cartels in history. Witness Sofia Vergara's captivating transformation into the godmother of the underworld. Griselda, now streaming only on Netflix. We're here to entertain you. We'll sing your songs. For good times, the best times, you can't go wrong. We'll two step, a new step, it won't be long. When the Dixieland is up playing, soon you'll be swaying, so come on, sing along. Hello and welcome to another episode of Before My Time. I am your host, Gelsey Laurie, and we are joined, as always, with our lovely producer and, let's face it, co-host, Matt Kelly, and he is going to tell us all about Jimmy Stewart. Let's go. Hi, friends. The world got you down. Don't be sad. Listen to $2 Late Fee with Zach and Dustin. $2 Late Fee is the podcast that celebrates the best decade of entertainment, the 1980s. We pick a movie and soundtrack from our youth that we loved and see if it holds up today. We also interview your favorite celebrities from that era. All in the spirit of positivity and togetherness. Check us out at $2LateFee.com. So, Gelsey, I found out something interesting with you when deciding to do this topic, which is that for all of the vintagey black and white stuff, Jimmy Stewart seems to be like a blind spot in your your film watching. Yeah, a gap in the timeline. There was like a glitch in my system, and he never made it onto my Rolodex. So what films have you seen with Jimmy Stewart that you know of? Like literally none. Oh, my God. I need to... Like to the point that I need to actually Google this right now. And I know the one that's like the classic. Well, there's a lot of classics. That's why I can't believe it. Like it's (laughs) this man has so many Oscar nominations. A vivacious lady I haven't even seen, which is Ginger Rogers. And that's the ones that I'm really surprised like that I should have. They just like they've been on my list and I've just never – gotten to them it's crazy the philadelphia story is is on my list okay the one i have seen this it's a wonderful life obviously i've seen that but like once okay it's not a christmas classic for me it's not one i watch every year like which surprises people when they are because everyone knows gelsey's oldie times yeah as one of my friends used to like to call me but yeah i just it's this is one of those things all right so so here's a quick breakdown of jimmy sword because it is it is not possible to to do all of this in a very short period of time. But what we'll say is, so he was he was born in Pennsylvania, so he's a PA boy, went to Princeton and began a career as a stage actor, appeared on Broadway, all of that stuff. Kind of typical for any popular actor of the 30s and 40s, right? Stage or Broadway mm-hmm. backgrounds, and then they make their way into uh, cinema once the talkies become a thing. He actually started acting in Frank Capra's uh, You Can't Take It With You. And that's worth noting because him and Capra definitely collaborated on a lot of films beyond that point. He got his first of five Academy Award nominations when he appeared as a senator in uh, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, a very popular political drama. But the only time he won an Academy Award for Best Actor was in Philadelphia Story, which again, I cannot believe you haven't seen Catherine Hepburn, know, Cary Grant, and Jimmy Stewart. It's such an amazing movie. He's one of the uh, actors that we talk about a lot, similar to an Elvis Presley that actually went out and fought in the Second World War, uh, which meant that he took a long break from acting at that point. And then after the war, this is when we get into like the big Jimmy Stewart run of him doing It's a Wonderful Life uh, and appearing mm-hmm. in a bunch of films by both Anthony Mann as well as Alfred Hitchcock. So that's like the the short rundown. Stays pretty active throughout the 60s and early 70s. Disappears 
a little bit at the end of the 70s and then makes one final appearance as a voice actor in American Tale, Fievel Goes West. Yeah, another one on my list. You've never seen American? What is, who are you? I've never, I'm I'm literally <laughs> going through his entire list of movies and the only one I've seen is It's a Wonderful Life. I just can't believe that as a child you didn't see American Tale, Fievel Goes West. <laughs> like, I, I remember my dad talking about it a lot, but sometimes like certain movies my dad pushed, we, it would make us not want to watch them more. Fair. Okay. So here's the thing. You know how people talk about Tom Hanks as like Mr. Mm-hmm. Everyman? Like that's like the charm of Tom Hanks is that he is this big, super famous star, but like the characters that he plays like make you feel like you could just like see him at a, on a park bench and just sit down and chat with him and hear like in a million amazing stories. Like literally Forrest Gump part. Yeah, exactly. Like that's <laughs> that's Jimmy Stewart to me. Like he is the yeah. 1930s and 40s version of very rarely do you see Jimmy Stewart playing a villainous character. More often than not, he's the hero of the story, but not in that like Charlton Heston like or or any of those other, you know, um, I'm, I'm blanking on so many names. But you know what I mean? Like the aha I know type exactly heroes. What I mean. You know what I mean? Like. He's yes. he's the reluctant hero. What, what he lacks in fists, he makes up for in genuine compassion and care and empathy towards his fellow man type type hero. Yeah, it isn't just that like Clark Gable kind of just dashing like, oh, I'm gonna take you in my arms and because I'm a man. It's it's like he actually has the characteristics of the things that a real human should have to be a great exactly. Person. And I think that that image mm-hmm. really did stem from Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, which again I I gotta explain all these because you've never seen any of them. But Mr. Smith Goes to Washington is a film about a newly appointed United States senator who fights against the entire corrupt political system. And it's starring him as this new senator who is immediately sickened by the corruption in politics and in Congress. And like it has so many beautiful speeches of Jimmy Stewart uh, with his, oh, well, geez, like, you know, like he has kind of that that, oh, man, type attitude going up and, and standing up for all of the everyman. And I think that from that point on, that really solidified how people saw Jimmy Stewart. Right. Mm-hmm. It's interesting because like this is one of those movies where I think that if a movie like Mr. Smith Goes to Washington came out in 2022, it would be like a small art house film. But instead, like Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, it was a box office smash. It made $3.5 million in the United States alone. And that in 1939 wow. is a lot of money. It was, huge. It was the second yeah. highest grossing film of the year and the third highest grossing film of the 30s, only behind Gone with the Wind and Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. Wow. Like, that's how massive this movie was. I really was. feel like I'm failing my name of this podcast <laughs> of not seeing it. <laughs> Know what I'm doing this weekend. Yeah, well, and then, so in 1940, that's when you get both Philadelphia Story and Shop Around the Corner are the two that I want to highlight. Um, Philadelphia Story, just a very charming little um, romantic comedy. It's based on a Broadway play of the same name, and it's mostly just a uh, screwball comedy you know, love triangle type situation. Classic screwball comedy type plot line. Um, and Shop Around the Corner, which even if you've never seen Shop Around the Corner, you might know it for the remade version of it in the 90s, a Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan film called You've Got Mail. Um, ah, the con- I do know You've Got yeah, Mail. Yeah, so the concept of Shop Around the Corner is this little tiny shop at Christmas time, and they bring in a new employee uh, to to work there, and it's this young woman. Um, and I'm blanking on who uh, played by Margaret Sullivan, uh, another one of those just like absolutely gorgeous, stunning women of the the 40s and 50s. Um, and Jimmy Stewart is like the well-established, definitely going to be the person who takes over the shop when the shopkeeper decides to retire type guy. And he's constantly annoyed by this young, klutzy uh, woman that they've hired in the shop almost to like a borderline misogynistic point in certain scenes, but simultaneously Mm -hmm. uh, he answered a classified note from a lonely person in the, in the mail to become pen pals. And he is unknowingly pen pals with the woman that he hates at work. Uh, And it's there thus becomes the, you've got mail plot point essentially of two Mm -hmm. people who hate each other in real life, unknowingly in love with each other through Mm -hmm. uh, other means. 
Um, it's very cute. It's a sweet movie. It's a good little Christmas one. It's not too Christmassy in a sense, but it's if you're looking for a nice like black and white classic Christmas movie. Um, and and I'm thinking that that might be a discussion for December for us is like Christmas classics that aren't classics uh, from that time period. Like for It's a Wonderful Life, there's so many other great Christmas like films that take right, place like that one's like the one that yeah that everyone that goes doesn't to, get but... on television yeah so yeah just throwing that out there shop around the corner if you're looking for something new for your christmas time um but as you said it's a wonderful life now it might not be a christmas classic for you but uh for matt kelly that is the christmas movie it's like that miracle on 34th street or like my two big classic go-tos <laughs> see my there's like trading places well and those get Christmas watched. Vacation. Those get watched for sure. Those get watched multiple times but like, every year. I think I think for me it's like it depends on what the aesthetic is, right? Like if I want to put on a Christmas movie mm-hmm. and laugh, absolutely like Trading Places and Christmas Vacation are in the contention. But if I want to just put on something that makes me feel like all of the good feelings that I feel about Christmas time, like those black and white classic movies where it's like, look, you it's not about the gifts. It's about like loving your fellow man. I'm like, yay, <laughs> Christmas. Um, but yes, uh, It's a Wonderful Life. Christmas classic, very long, but very, uh, I, I would argue, one of the best films ever made. Uh, was nominated for five Academy Awards, uh, even though it didn't win any of them, I'm pretty sure. And uh, infamously, the way it became a Christmas classic was that it did horrendous at the box office um by all did it really? yeah by all accounts it was considered a massive disappointment which led to no one bothering to update the copyright on the film so when 30 years passed and the copyright no longer applied tv stations started running it at christmas time because they could get it for free because it had entered the public domain And that's how it really became a Christmas classic. No one really knew or thought about the movie until that happened. Um, But for those of you who don't know, It's a Wonderful Life. Beautiful story in which, again, your every man, Jimmy Stewart, decides he's going to kill himself on Christmas Eve. And an angel comes down and shows him what the world would be like if he had never been born. And it makes him realize that while to himself, he doesn't feel like he made a giant impact in in his life he realizes that the people around him are all in a better place because he exists in their world and i i think that that's one of those stories that's nice to hear because especially you and me and a lot of our friends that we know we're very focused on our goals uh when it comes to creative arts you know what i mean you're mm-hmm. you know are you a success if you're not doing what you love as a career or you know there's there's a lot of things that that come up is like what defines a success, but we sometimes get so focused on the, you know, your name and lights portion of success that we forget that like having family and friends that love and adore you is its own form of success. And I think that that's yeah. a really beautiful and impact message. too. Yeah. Yeah. It's not even just having people around that love you, but how, like, like you said, it's like how you've impacted other people. And like, I, I do love that story that it is, you might feel like you're worthless, but it's like just as simple as the one time you did something for a stranger that turned their day around and maybe led them down a different path, which completely changed their life. Kind of an idea of that butterfly effect and that we're all important. And yeah, no, I love that. Yeah, no, it's it's awesome. Um, then we enter into 1948 with Rope, which is the beginning of his relationship with Alfred Hitchcock. Do you, what do you know about the movie? Which Rope? I just realized I have seen Rear, Win- Rear Window. Okay, so that's another. But it's been a while. But I haven't seen Rope. I, Alfred Hitchcock is another one of those. I I love his style, but I I haven't dove that deeply, ironically, into him. So just because. So do you know anything about the movie Rope? I know absolutely nothing about Rope. Okay, so the movie Rope is, in my opinion, and this is going to sound insane. I think it is the most impressive film that Alfred Hitchcock ever made. Matt, that sounds insane. Well, I mean, (laughs) because Psycho exists, right? Like that's like people's go to. But the premise of Rope and why I think that you would love Rope is that it is based on a true story. It's about two young men who kill one of their classmates as an intellectual exercise that they can commit the perfect crime by not being caught. Right. 
So they kill and they hide his body in a wooden chest and then throw a dinner party in their apartment, hoping that no one will take notice that there's a dead body in the room. That's like the little game that they're playing. But what's impressive about the movie is that it is just four long shots stitched together to feel like one continuous shot that takes place in real time the entire movie. That's cool. So it's it's a really impressive feat. And I think the little trick that he plays, the movie itself is 80 minutes, but it's supposed to take place over a two hour period. So what they do is that there's a giant window behind the characters and they filmed essentially two hours of the sun going down and night happening and then sped it up just enough so that that two hours was consolidated to the 80 minutes of the movie. So like while you're watching it, because you're seeing the actual like time change behind you, it really does feel like two hours has passed by while you're it's. There's so many That's cool. interesting little camera tricks. If you only watch one Alfred Hitchcock movie, I actually think Rope is a great one to check out. And it's okay. it's one of the limited setting type films where it's all in one room the entire time. So it's it's definitely a unique film. I'll definitely watch it. And actually, as you were saying that, I was like, well, I need to watch all the Hitchcock movies that I have not seen because duh, but um, I'll do that before October and we'll do an Alfred Hitchcock Ooh, I love that. episode in October. I love that. Yeah. And then you've already mentioned- Promising the people. You you mentioned Rear Window. Um, we won't dive too hard mm-hmm. into Rear Window. You've probably seen a million and one parodies of Rear Window at this point, but Jimmy Stewart has a broken leg, sees his neighbor across the way, commit a murder, and becomes obsessed with- A, confirming that he saw what he saw, and then B, making sure that the man uh, gets arrested properly. It's got some great twists and turns. It's got some really great intense sequences in there. Um, He also did the remake of The Man Who Knew Too Much for Alfred Hitchcock, but I really think the the big one for him was Vertigo, or uh, what I always think of it as the movie that Mel Brooks was making fun of when he made High Anxiety. I, that's the thing. I haven't actually seen Vertigo, but I've seen High Anxiety because <laughs> if you have heard my previous episode on Spaceballs, if you haven't, go check it out now. I'm a huge fucking Mel Brooks fan, and so a lot of a lot of Mel Brooks's movies I've seen actually. Mel Brooks is what introduced me to said movies. I saw Young Frankenstein before Frankenstein, Dracula, Robin Hood, all of those. It's like, as a kid, how I knew those stories. Yeah. And Vertigo, again, not not one I want to spoil too much of. Go see it. It's a classic. You've probably seen parodies of it. But uh, just a great example of, A, Jimmy Stewart probably playing the most, I wouldn't say sinister, but the most corrupted man that he's played in a long time because he is a, a man-obsessed with with a woman um it's it is noteworthy for being the first film to ever use a dolly zoom um which is a pretty interesting camera effect you'll know it when you see it but uh the the example i always give is um in jaws when roy schneider sees the little boy get attacked in the water and it does this weird zoom where Mm -hmm. it feels like you're zooming in to roy schneider's face while the background doesn't feel like it's zooming at all like it's a very like jarring effect but this was the, Vertigo was the first film to ever use it to create that feeling of Vertigo. The only other classic that I want to jump back to is a movie that I think about ever since the day I saw it. Harvey. Are you familiar with Harvey? Not at all. Okay. So are you familiar with Who Framed Roger Rabbit? Of course. Okay. So I discovered Harvey through Who Framed Roger Rabbit. There's a scene in the movie where the judge comes in and he's asking them if they've seen a rabbit. And one of the drunks at the bar says, oh, I seen a rabbit. And he describes Roger Rabbit perfectly. And then he's like, well, show him to me. And he goes, all right, introduce yourself, Harvey. The concept of Harvey is about this brilliant man who has become a drunk, but swears that his best friend is a six foot rabbit named Harvey that no one can see but him. That's funny. Yes, it's and it's but it is absolutely so beautiful. And there's these wonderful speeches throughout the movie. And it's it's a lot of examining a is Harvey real. And it constantly plays with it where it's like throughout most of the movie, you feel like, well, Jimmy Stewart must be crazy or drunk. But then you'll see things happen that can only be described as something 
that we can't see has moved something on a table or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's this examination of his family desperately trying to fix him, but seeing that he is a much happier man. Uh, And the quote that I would always think about from this movie, there's a scene where they're asking him about it. And he says, you know, years ago, my mother used to say to me, she say, in this world, Elwood, you must be, she always called me Elwood. In this world, Elwood, you must be oh so smart or oh so pleasant. Well, for years I was smart. I recommend pleasant. And you may quote me. And that is kind of the theme of the entire movie is I think that you would love Harvey. Uh, It was based on a play that uh, Jimmy Stewart was a cast member of at the time that it was playing on Broadway in his early days of being a Broadway actor. Just you could tell that he has a real passion for this particular story and this character. And it is a beautiful movie. You know, it's he he made a lot of these beautiful films. And it's funny because I, I jokingly mentioned this to you at the start. Like, I can't believe you've never seen American Tale, Five Goes West. That was probably my first introduction to Jimmy Stewart uh, in his last ever role. Um, he plays Wiley Burp, who is a uh, alcoholic dog that used to be the sheriff of this town before uh, the evil cats came and ran it over and five has to train him on how to, to clean up his act and sober up and, and be the, the great so- sheriff that he was known to be the great gunslinger. Um, and yeah, it's the last film he did. He died just six years after that film was released. And that's kind of the reason why we're talking about Jimmy Stewart. I probably should have said that up front. So on July 2nd, 1997 at the ripe age of 89, Jimmy Stewart died. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you know, celebrating his memory this month. He died of a pulmonary embolism. I'm glad he was older. Yeah, he was in he was in his 80s, nearing his 90s, which honestly, in 1997 is is kind of pushing pushing the age limits. I feel like, I, yeah, it's pretty good because I mean, now, yeah, we're just now getting to where like living to 100 doesn't seem like an impossible task, like in this day and age. It's not. <laughs> like, I'm living into my hundred teens, like I'm gonna give myself like 112, 113. That's your goal. Yeah, I want to be that bitch that doesn't die. I want to be like the Queen of England. If I get to 80, I'll be pretty content. <laughs> like, really? Yeah. Oh my god, I definitely want to be in my 90s. I feel like I I'm already halfway like, out. Old the woman door. on Titanic. <laughs> <laughs> throwing a diamond over the ocean. <laughs> but uh you're already halfway at the door. God, is that depressing. is that what it sounds like when an old lady tosses a diamond off a boat? Yes. Have you not seen Titanic seen Matt? Titanic. When she chucks the necklace off, she goes, <laughs> like she does this little gasp, and it's like the one thing I take away from that film that stands out the most is her ah. and I don't know if it's this release or regret. I don't know, Rose. So I don't know. So here's a fun story about me and Titanic. Um so I did eventually see Titanic in its in its entirety. Eventually, yeah. So when Titanic came, you didn't see it in the theaters. No, I rebelled against it because I was such a Star oh, Wars nerd. I was such a Star Wars nerd. I was like, no, this movie cannot beat Star Wars for the highest grossing film of all time because I was. So your one ticket price is that definitely was what was going to be the difference. Over. <laughs> so my parent, my mom, and my sisters went to see Titanic for like the fourth time. And I wanted to go to the movies. So I think my brother and I went to see the Lost in Space movie with like Matt LeBlanc. I love yeah. Lost with, um, yeah. And um, what's her name? Lacey something. She's Gretchen and Mean Girls. Yeah. She's like t- 13 in that movie. Yeah. I love that movie. So we saw. And Heather Graham. So we. Oh my God. Sorry. I love Lost in Space. So we saw that in theaters. And. Okay. Um, you know, that movie is just over two hours versus Titanic's uh, massive run. Of like three and a half hours or something. It's a long, it's a long fucking Holy, movie. It is. I just realized ni- 1997, December of 97 and eight. I was seven years old when I went and saw it in theaters. I think I, I might have been the first movie I saw in theaters that I got to see some boobs. So, so my parents, so basically we snuck in, the- we snuck in to watch Titanic after we were done Lost in Space because we were like, we can stand outside for the next hour and a half and wait for this movie to be over or sneak into the theater where our parents are. And they still don't get your money. And they still don't get my money. Um, and we literally <laughs> snuck in just as the ship was sinking. And oh. all I remember was that 
even with knowing no context of the movie, I still was crying at the last like five minutes I knew of the it. movie. I was like, you still cried, didn't <laughs> I you? Like, I was like, oh no, this Can got me. Not. It got me. It got me, I damn it. Oh, it's so good. It's a very, so good. It's a very good like, movie. We should do a Kate Titanic Leo, episode soon. Not like about the movie, but just about the ship in general. <laughs> Oh, we can, yeah. I've been um, to the Titanic Museum where the actual ship was built. Oh, well, then there we go. You know what I was thinking, actually? You said something about one of his films and, like, the kind of guy he was. And I was like, do you know who I feel like he could have played? And it would have been a route in the same – the right time of his age getting older in the late 60s is To Kill a Mockingbird. I feel like he would have been a good Atticus fan. I think that you're absolutely I, right with that. And yeah. I'm curious. Let me check. I just want to see – I don't think we really get too much information on – like who was in the running for what and stuff, but I wouldn't be yeah, shocked. I'm curious if because it was Gregory Peck um, who played him. Oh, 1962. Oh, sorry, it was early Jimmy 60s. Stewart declined the role of Atticus Fitch, concerned that the Boom. story was too controversial Damn, for him. Oh, I'm good. You were just discussing like <laughs> Mr. Smith goes to Washington and like how his character was, and I just I saw Atticus Finch in the courtroom as you were saying that, and I was like, he's such an Atticus. That is so funny that you like called that perfectly. Of the movies I talked about which I know I just rattled them off at like rapid succession, but which one having me explain to you why this man is so amazing to me, uh, which one are you like, all right, that's the one I want to watch next. I know it's really hard. You know, me being me, it um, would be a tie between rope and the Philadelphia story. Yeah. I was like, what's the one that takes place in Philadelphia? I was like, oh my God, Philadelphia story. <laughs> Guys, it's fine. It's been a long. What's that week. movie where they try to go it's... back to the future? <laughs> <laughs> literally, literally. I was like, oh shit. God, I saw this movie the other day. It was about a bunch of dinosaurs. They were in some type of park from the Jurassic era. I just can't think of what the name <laughs> of it was. <laughs> Look, my voice is shot. My brain's a little wonky. I'm giving it my own. yeah. Those sound like my two, and they're complete opposites. But like, I want to see him in just a real lighthearted screwball comedy. And I love Catherine Hepburn. And then I love suspenseful i love your window i love you know so it's that sounds like completely and and how you described how hitchcock kind of shot it that intrigued me perfect hey do you have an idea for a podcast but don't know where to start or do you have an already existing podcast that you want to take to the next level well check out we know podcasting.com from concept development to theme music to editing to logos we know podcasting.com is a one-stop shop for all things pod don't hesitate to hit us up. We're very nice. All right, Kelsey, I'm curious about one thing. So we've, we've established that somehow Jimmy Stewart was like just missing in your entire mm -hmm. takedown of, of popular culture from the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. But <laughs> in his place, there must be some other actor that that was your version of the 50s, 40s, Etc. Every man, like if someone asked you who was the actor that represented the every man back then, who is who would be like the name that would jump to you? Oh, fuck, I don't even know. I feel like I was so centered around females, or we'll say the every woman, we'll say the every woman then. Like, I don't know why I would say th the two that come into my head would be Audrey Hepburn and Grace Kelly. I think those are good options. I think those are very good options. More, the reason I hesitated is because they're almost not. They're they're more the glamorous, sweet. You know, you don't see as much of a diverse side on both, but you do. Because everyone else, you know, I, I, I can't say Betty Davis because she's not. She's just such the strong leading lady. She's she's your film noir. Same with Barbara Stanwyck. It's... Um, that's why I, I didn't go with them. I think I think that both of the ones that you, Grace Kelly and Aud Audrey Hepburn, have kind of a similar vibe as like um, Marilyn Monroe, almost. Where it's like they're yeah, they're but gorgeous, they're fashionable, but there's there's that element of with with the two of them versus Marilyn Monroe, where like Marilyn Monroe always hit the stage almost knowing like there was something about her presence that said she knows that she's the most gorgeous woman mm -hmm. in this room. She's a sex where, pot too. Yeah. And where she, like Hepburn and Kelly always kind of felt like, oh, they don't, they don't know. They don't know how beautiful they are. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, and it's, they weren't also sold as a sex symbol and they were dressed 
more sweet, sweetly than you'll get, you know, Marilyn dressed on, on screen. It's just so hard. Cause I feel like with my Rolodex, I'm just going through and I'm like, yeah, they're more like the musical every woman. Like in the thirties, honestly, Ginger Rogers really was, and her acting is amazing. And she does have a lot of dramatic roles. Um, but she's just so tied into the singing and dancing that it's hard to not just, but you know, it, cause they're more in the fifties is Grace yeah. Kelly and, um, and Audrey Hepburn and into the 60s. But if I'm going into the 30s, I mean, there's so many I know I'm missing. But I, I would I would definitely give Ginger Rogers a, a run for her money. Obviously a dancer that we gave a lot of credit to in a previous episode as well. But I feel like if we're talking every man, there was something about Donald O'Connor that felt very mm-hmm. approachable compared to a lot of the other leading men at that time. <laughs> yeah, I'm almost anyone that you're going to get in the musicals are going to feel like that. Yeah. Because I could say that about Fred Astaire. Yeah. No, and I more so than Gene, more so than Gene Kelly. Yeah, Gene, Gene Kelly, Kelly, I don't think seems like the approachable every man. <laughs> no, he seems very. I'm on stage. I have makeup on, and I'm playing this role. Nothing again. He's fucking amazing, and yeah. and I I can't believe. And I think I said this in a previous episode. My sister and I always get into arguments of who's the better dancer, and I say it's Fred Astaire, and she says it's Gene Kelly. But I think I think it's the same thing with the Marilyn Monroe. It's it's the difference mm-hmm. of someone who gives off the presence that they know that they're the most talented person in that room. And the person who gives off the idea of like, yeah, I'm okay. And then they like blow you away with how fucking incredible they are. Yeah. (laughs) And that's what kind of Fred does for me. And and it's also, he just has this very endearing part of him. That's this very, I want to bring you in and approachable. And he's not as handsome as Gene Kelly. And because that's one thing my sister was Gene Kelly didn't sing dance and cheek to cheek. So (laughs) exactly. No. And (laughs) He, he's not. He's not as handsome, but I think there's something so charming about Fred, and you do fall in love with him every time because he has that thing. And even when he's playing a more cheeky, kind of malicious character, which he does where he kind of is out for a certain motive, you still just love him. Yeah. No, I think that that's a good call. So if our listeners have other names that they're like, how could you not think to say so-and-so? Which- and they will. They'll let us know. I know. I was where- like, I know I'm going to like in an hour be like, I'm a dumbass. I should have thought of blah, 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 but. Where can they tell us how badly yeah, we screwed up? <laughs> tell us how badly we screwed up um, and that I need to drink throat coat on Instagram. You can find <laughs> us at our handle at before my time underscore podcast. You can also find us on Facebook. Just search before my time. We'll pop up right on the wall there. Say, hey, say hi. Say you really badly screwed up. Um, also, <laughs> while you're here, if you're enjoying listening to us, which I hope you are, go ahead and give us a five-star review and leave us a positive comment. That's how we get to more listeners like yourself. We love what we do, and we appreciate each and every one of you. Thanks, guys. Network.